You guys, I am so excited that Home Goods is my sponsor because Home Goods is amazing. I don't know if you've ever been in the store, but every time you go, there is new amazing things. And I find myself unable to stop from buying things like throws or decorative pillows. I just love it. And it's like this great sense of discovery and you get such awesome finds at great prices that I just continually load up. So I was thrilled to hear that Home Goods wanted to sponsor my show because I'm thrilled to bring their brand to you if you don't already know them you should definitely go and see what you can find to make your home better i know that moms don't have a lot of time to do a lot of stuff but making a nice home is something that is super important and just bring a smile to all our faces so check out home goods for big ticket items or just seasonal decor they have creative innovative awesome find that's always changing so you'll never get bored with their selection which is fantastic um so go finding at home goods today Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Daisy Dowling is the author of Work Parent, the complete guide to succeeding on the job, staying true to yourself, and raising happy kids. She's the founder and CEO of Work Parent, an executive coaching and training firm dedicated to helping working parents lead more successful and satisfying lives. Daisy began Work Parent with the simple, bold vision that all working parents could succeed on the job and remain true to themselves while raising terrific kids and take pride in doing so. As an advisor to working parents, Daisy draws on her 15 years as a human capital expert and executive coach, helping leaders at all levels improve their performance, drive success of their teams and organizations, and find happiness in their careers. She ran global talent and leadership development efforts at four Fortune 500 companies and has worked as a consultant and advisor to clients throughout the U.S., Latin America, Europe, and Asia. An acknowledged expert on careers, personal development, and work-life balance, she's published 16 articles in Harvard Business Review, author dedicated chapters in the HBR Guide to Coaching Employees, the Harvard Business Review on Managing Yourself, and the HBR Guide to Work-Life Balance, as well as serving as series editor for the HBR Working Parents Collections of Books. Her original writing has also appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Journal of Applied Corporate Finance, European Business Review, Dallas Morning News, and Elle Magazine. And her advice has been featured in the LA Times, Sunday Times UK, and on CNN. In 2004, her book, Remember Who You Are, Harvard Business School Publishing, on personal authenticity at work, became an international bestseller and has since been published in nine languages. See how we hid that at the very end of that bio, and that was really exciting. Anyway, a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Business School, Daisy lives in New York with her husband, a proud working father, and their two young children. And by the way, Daisy's mother was my fourth grade teacher. So there you go. Welcome, Daisy. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss your book, Work Parent. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a thrill. I know we were chatting before, but your mom was my teacher who I've never forgotten. And I remember you because you were like a celebrity in my mind because you were related to her and she was like God. So, you know, to be interviewing you, I still, it still like gives me a thrill and I'm 45 years old. It's crazy. So, <laughs> well, you know, everybody remembers their fourth grade teacher. You can ask anybody who that was. And we think back, it's a pivotal year. It's a big deal going from nine to 10. It's true. It really is. Oh my gosh. Well, congratulations. You've had so much career success. I love it. I was like, your bio is amazing. And of course, everything you shared in the book, which your work has informed. Would you mind telling listeners about, well, everything is sort of interlinked, but let's start with the book and in whatever order you want your career, which became the book. The book is your consulting company. So you, you tell it. Sure. So, so I'll, I'll say that my book is a travel guide book to combining career and caregiving without losing yourself in the process. So staying healthy and whole as you meet the responsibilities that are two big sets of responsibilities in your life. And when people say, well, why did you write this book? Or what was your inspiration? I feel like I should have a really sort of lofty, glossy answer to it. And the real answer is necessity. So I wrote this book because I really desperately wanted to read this book. So nine years ago, my first daughter was born. I have two little girls who are nine and seven now. 
And when she was born, I was working in-house at a big company as an executive coach. And I could give a lot of people advice about how to you know, manage their careers and get ahead professionally. But I just didn't have much advice to give them on how to do that while being the parents that they wanted to be. And I felt a little bit on my back foot about that. And then you can see where this is going. When I had my own first baby, of course, the problem kind of came home with me. And I didn't know how to do so many things, like tell my boss that I needed to leave mid-afternoon because I had to take my daughter to the pediatrician. So I pushed the stroller literally down to the flagship Barnes & Noble one day. And I said to the very nice clerk at the store, where's the working parent book, right? Because there's a book for everything. And he said, well, there's the career section and went like this to hundreds of books in one part of the store. And he said, and there's the parenting section. And he pointed to the other part of the store. And there didn't seem to be anything that really brought those two together. And long story short, that set me on the journey to kind of gathering all this advice and different kinds of supports and perspectives that working parents can use and then to ultimately collecting them in what I've written. Wow. So where are they shelving your book? Are you in the parenting section or are they going to put it in the, in the career section? It's, it's in the work section. And I, I come to this work as an executive coach. So, so I, I will readily say, and my children would probably also tell you that I'm not a parenting expert. I, I come from the angle of How do we succeed and thrive and be ourselves professionally while also holding what's really important, dear and central? And so that's that's the the sort of you know what I bring. And I think therefore why the book is written the way it is, as an executive coaching conversation that happens on the page and and why it is in the category or the section that it is. Well, I'm glad we're doing this particular interview now because I don't know if you've heard the screaming in the background, but my kids are in the other room and have these two friends over who are particularly loud. Anyway, so this is my intersection of career and home and (laughs) everything else. Well, I'm in my daughter's bedroom and I've blurred the background so that you can't see all of her, you know, nine-year-old stuff. So this is is how we're living right now. Yeah, how we get it done. (laughs) Work-life integration. Yes. I think that, I mean, obviously with the pandemic, it's all become blurred anyway, right? The fact that there are no really clear lines and that so many people aren't even going back to the office. And so home, you know, in a way, I like that people remember now that the people they work with are actual people, right? I feel like it used to be so cordoned off, like this is who you were at work and you can't like talk about your family or your private stuff or whatever. And then this is who you really are or something off on the side. Right. Right, right. That you were actually two people. You're you're one person doing two roles without any contradiction between those two things, right? You can be yourself in both places. I do think though, this blurring of boundaries is really good in a way, but it also leads to some really, really big pressures. So people feel like they're always on. They always have to be giving in both spheres of their life. Like they always have to be doing something or productive every moment of their day. So a lot of the work that I do with my one-to-one coaching clients now, so I work, I support working moms and dads, is helping them figure out where even really artificially, because we don't have a lot of tactical boundaries, but where artificially they can draw a line and say, all right, after 7 p.m. in the evening, I'm going to physically close my laptop and I will fully permission myself to be fully present and available as a dad to my kids for the next two hours. And then if I have to get back online, I will. But having some of that clean break and that distinction is really important to showing up as your full self, being able to focus, not not feeling so sort of crazed and chaotic, and also doing better in both spheres, I think. So that that's important to to push us back to also. I was out with my kids yesterday and I had my phone with me and I had not allocated it as the time where I would just be with my kids in my head, FYI. It was just like during the day. And so I was trying to keep up with everything else. And so I was, you know, my little girl who's, I have four kids and the one who was talking is eight. And she kept being like, mom, mom. And finally she was like, what about being just in the moment? <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, this is too much. I was like, okay, I'm in the moment. I'm sitting next to you. I'm playing with kinetic sand with one hand and I'm on my phone at the other hand. I'm doing my best here, you know, but like, okay. it's never enough. Cut cut me a break and you're eight. Right? It's like, what do you need me to do? Like make your own sandcastle or something? You know, this is like not the beach. It was sand on a table, right? (laughs) So, oh yeah. Even if you cordon off the hours, I feel like then the next hour comes and they're like, you're never available. There's just so much pressure. 
There is so much pressure and, and there's always something more to do, right? There's, there's your to-do list and my to-do list. Like they would stretch across the country if we unrolled them. Right. And, and everybody's is, and we could go 24 seven and that list would never get shorter. So, so one of the techniques I encourage a lot of working parents to think about using is keeping some kind of list or, or scorecard for themselves about things they've already accomplished. So if you haven't done something, it's top of mind, right? It's always nagging at you. I need to call my child's teacher back. I need to get that report done for work. I need to do whatever it is. And you forget everything that you've done and accomplished that's so good. So if you can keep a a running tally for yourself of, I did have a really good parent-teacher conference, or I did spend just time snuggling with my toddler before bed last night, or I did have a good meeting with somebody at work who's a really difficult customer and, you know, we got to a great resolution on whatever it was. If you can make a list of that and then actually read down that list on a regular basis, it sort of re-anchors you back in this, I'm doing a lot. I, there's My commitment is total and, and I'm accomplishing things. I'm on the right path. And I think that's a powerful feeling when you feel like the sense of frenzy and it's never done because that's not, the treadmill is not an easy place to feel like you're getting momentum, right? You want to feel like you're moving forward. Unless you're like at Barry's boot camp or something. <laughs> correct. Correct. And I, I wouldn't know much about that. <laughs> me, me neither. I just know I tried it once and I like could not keep up. I was like, this is not, this is not for me. But to your point, like this is while the kinetic sand was going on, I start making a to-do list just for what I had to do last night. And when my daughter and I was with my mom too, they saw my list. They're like, oh my gosh. I was like, no, no, this is just like what I have for the next like two or three hours. Like then by the time tomorrow ends, I'll have a totally new to-do list. They're like all those things. I'm like, that's what I'm doing when I'm like at my desk frantic, right? I'm doing stuff. But anyway, to your point, I'm like, I should really write a new list because it's pretty. And I'm like, no, I'm just going to admire the fact that there are all these things crossed out. (laughs) Do you ever put things on your to-do list that you've already done so that you can immediately cross them out? Yes. Sometimes where I'm like, oh, I forgot I had to do that. Boop, boop. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, Cause it gives you that sense of you're going or, or put something really easy on the list yes. so you can yeah. cross it out Lunch. quickly. Yeah. Done. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, the thing that was so great about your book is you start off by giving everybody a framework based on age. Like you, you come at it from all the different spheres first, just yeah. by age. Like, what do you need to know if you have toddlers? What do you need to know when you have teenagers? And then you go into different things in your, well, towards the end, you go into different things like your own health and how to keep yourself balanced. And then what if you're an entrepreneur? What if you're a CEO? What if you run the show? What if you like all these different values and things and ways of, of coming at it. How did you decide to structure it? Cause I feel like you had five or six parts and each one could have been its own book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it was great. There's so much information. It's amazing. Yeah. So when I first started writing the book, one thing that was really important to me was to have every parent who picked it up felt like it, it spoke to them. And that's, that's, you know, an ambitious thing to try and do, but in a lot of the working parent conversations and, you know, workshops and coaching I had done, there were so many parents who for a lot of different reasons, told me that they didn't feel like they were part of sort of the group of working parents. Like, well, I have older children and I know the people who really have it tough are moms of, you know, of new babies or people who are just returning from parental leave or we're an LGBT family. And I'm not sure that some of my concerns are always reflected in the, or I'm an entrepreneur or I, you know, I don't have the flexibility to work from home. So, you know, some of the conversation doesn't relate to me. So I I came at the book from thinking, okay, from the person who just picks this up and who wants to feel reassured and included, how do we start there? And then I was able to drill down and try and make it digestible. So there's the the chronological section, which is from birth or pre-arrival to teenage years. And then by different sort of category of, of how people thought about parenting, resources is one section. And then health and wellness and feeling yourself and together is another section. And some of the tactical stuff around career is another section. So I was just trying to think about how to make it navigable with that inclusive lens on top. We interrupt this podcast for a special announcement from the National Honey Board. Help us save the honeybees this September with Honey Saves Hives. 
Honeybees, as you may know, are responsible for more than 35% of the foods we eat and the honey we enjoy, and they continue to face challenges every year. And by the way, if you haven't seen Bee Movie, I watched it recently with my kids, so they are very aware of this whole thing and are thrilled this is my sponsor now. Uh, September is National Honey Month, and to celebrate, the National Honey Board has launched Honey Saves Hives, partnering with several U.S. food and beverage companies who will each make a donation to Project Apis M, A P I S M, period, the largest honeybee nonprofit in the country. By purchasing select made with honey products from participating brands during the month of September, you can help save the honeybees. Participating companies include Companion Baking, Justin's, Lost Cause, Metery, M E A D E R Y, Melee Water, M E L L E, and Purely Elizabeth. Oh my gosh, I love Purely Elizabeth Granola. Uh, visit HoneySavesHives.com for more info. Again, join me in helping save the honeybees this month by participating in the Honey Saves Hives program. Visit HoneySavesHives.com for more info. And now back to our show. We interrupt this podcast for a special announcement. Today's sponsor is Peloton. I am thrilled to be talking about Peloton because I have a Peloton bike, which I got as a gift right after I had my fourth child um, from a loving family member. And I have found it to be a total lifesaver in terms of wanting to feel better in my body and maintain some level of fitness and health um, in the midst of my crazy busy life. And I love the classes. My favorite teacher happens to be Allie Love, and she is super inspiring and motivational and and I just look forward to spending time watching her lead the classes. It's like just amazing. And I always leave sweating and feeling better than I did. And anytime I make time for it, I am super grateful. You should definitely check out the bikes and everything they have to offer on OnePeloton.com. With the Peloton bike, there's nothing like working out from home. Learn more at OnePeloton.com. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N dot com. New members can try Peloton classes free for 30 days at onepeloton.com slash app, which is super cool. The classes are amazing, and they also have other things aside from just um, uh, things you can do on the bike. So you should definitely check it out. Thank you, Peloton, for the sponsorship, and I hope you will just go check out the website. You don't have to get on a bike right now. Just first go to the website. That'll be your first step today. OnePeloton.com. And now back to our show. Love it. And then for people who that's still not enough, you'll do coaching with them. Yes. <laughs> so I do a lot of one-to-one -one coaching. And the, and the wonderful part about my job is that I'm sort of surprised and challenged every day. So the book is 550 pages long. And I felt like, wow, I, you know, I really captured a lot of stuff. And then every Every day I will have a parent ask me a question or make a recommendation or say, here's a habit or practice that really works for me. And I've never heard it before. Or I, I'm thinking, gee, I don't know how to answer that. And I think that's part of why I love this work. But it also, yeah, it feels like this book could have been a lot longer. But as you know, as an author, at some point you have to say, here's here's what I'm going to deliver. I'm on a deadline yeah. <laughs> and we got so, so many pages and words that we can use. But 500, I mean, it's a lot of material. How did you sit down? Like, did you do extensive outlining and then you tackled section by section? And how long did the whole thing take? And like all the research and, you know, there's a lot in here. Yeah. Yeah. So I started by outlining. So I, I've just found in my own writing that it's easier to sort of pretend I'm an architect and put together the, the you know, the blueprint and the plans and understand how the structure is going to work before I think about sort of like the drywall and the bricks and the decorative moldings and that kind of stuff. So, so I started with, with just the question, which is what would any working parent want to pick up and see? And, and I honestly took inspiration from a lot of other books that you and I and everybody else is familiar with. Like you think about like the Lonely Planet travel guidebooks, you know, it, it covers your whole trip. So what would make people feel like that? And so I outlined appropriately. And then I went out and I did a lot of research. So a lot of the stuff that's in the book is based on, a little bit is based on my own experience as a parent. A lot is based on my coaching work. And then really kind of the meat and potatoes of the book is based on what I heard from other working parents. And I spoke to 
a couple hundred of them just on a pure play research basis, not in my coaching practice. And I deliberately went very broad. So I spoke to people, you know, with teenagers, with multiples from different backgrounds and cultures and beliefs overseas or in different parts of the country. I spoke to people who are in frontline jobs, you know, police officers, a single mom firefighter, healthcare workers. Some of this was going on during the pandemic, but I also spoke to people in every, you know, every different field. I wanted to try and mix it up and make sure that I was grabbing all the different nuggets of advice from this broad group so that the kind of the crowdsource and distilled product would would really work for people. It would give people the most traction. So, I mean, it's hard to take all of the research and, and narrow it down, but if there were a couple things that stressed out working parents could do to show the kids that, you know, to, to maintain sanity or, you know, just do a better job. What would some of the things, aside from having dedicated time with your phone off, what would like your top two tips be? Not to yeah. put you on the spot here, but. Yeah, no, no, no. So if I could leave people with no other task or idea or whatever, <laughs> it would be to try and spend just a little bit of time mapping out and understanding and taking control of your working parent template. So your working parent template is sort of your mental model of what working parenthood is and means and requires, and particularly of what good working parenthood is. And it's made up of this sort of, it's a kind of a mosaic-like picture of all the different experiences and bits of advice and observations that you've made about working parenthood really over the course of your life. So if you saw your mom work full time, but she always came home at 5.30 and cooked dinner for you and then helped you with homework afterwards, that's great. Your mom was a great role model, but you may have it in your template, in your mind that if I'm going to be a good working mom, that means cooking every night for the kids or sitting down for dinner every night with them or always being available to help with homework. Now, that's not right or wrong, good or bad. It's your experience, but you're going to be in for some really rough sledding if you're always holding yourself in comparison to this template, if you're kind of working under this layer of shoulds. And those shoulds might come from your social media feed or from your own parents or from your career mentors or from your current colleagues. And maybe the other moms at work say, oh, you know, when you have a second child, you should really tap the brakes professionally because that's just what you should do. And, you know, you should think about flex time. Maybe you should, but maybe you don't want to, or maybe that doesn't fit with your career, or maybe you're not at the right juncture, or you need the income, or whatever it is. So figure out where all those bits and pieces are coming from. Jot them down on a piece of paper, and then step back and say, here are my own ambitions and goals and the contours of my job and my family structure and my resources in all different senses of that term. Here's the working parent life I want to and can lead. And I'm not going to kind of beat myself up with all these shoulds and expectations and images of, you know, what good working parenthood involves. And I think that really frees you up to start making your own decisions and, and to feel more confident and less burdened. I like that. I've had this experience where I didn't realize I was becoming a full-time working parent. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, I think ah. when you start your own thing, it just things like kind of ramp up until all of a sudden it's like, do I have a full-time job? Like I'm working all the time. So maybe that's what full-time is. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, I've been thinking about these issues, which is why your book is so timely and so welcome because I've been like, well, you know, is it okay? Like how many, like, what do I judge it on? Is it how many hours I'm in my with the door closed versus working with the door open. You know, those are like different things, right? right? Like like my dad used to always, like I would sit on his lap and he would be like reading work documents, but like, I was okay with that because I was still, you know, so I don't know. I think it's all like what, as you're saying, what you grew up with, like what you feel okay doing and, and I guess, yeah, just owning it in some way. Yeah. And, and straight up, I I think entrepreneurs have it the hardest. You know, I, I, I have a whole chapter in the book about, people who are small business owners or freelancers or entrepreneurs. And I think there's a, there's a view and I I've held it. I'm now working for myself also, but there was a view when you're in a demanding job that like, Oh, if I, if I worked for myself, I would set my own hours and I would have flexibility. It, it sort of like would be this easier kind of happier, more work-life friendly environment. And in reality that then there's no guardrails, right? If, if your boss isn't there to say, you're on or you're off. When are you on and off? And as as one working mom entrepreneur I interviewed said, she said, I get to take vacation when my boss lets me. And I I sort of paused and she said, and I'm the boss and and my boss never lets me. So so it, it can be very tricky to navigate. 
when when you are in that kind of self-directed career. I think vacation also is like, what does that really mean anymore, right? Because <laughs> it's not where you are physically, right? Because we're all working from everywhere now. But it's like, if you take a vacation, what it really means is you're just going to be really behind. You're, like, it's not really a vacation. It's like, you're just going to decide not to get anything done and then have twice as much to go back to. So it's hard to, you know, I, where did I read somewhere that it wasn't the fact that people got so many emails, but the company had decided that they would take care of all of this employee's emails for her or him when they went on vacation. Right. right? Have you heard this? It's like somebody will cover for you. Yeah. Like right? they do all the emails. It's like amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Instead of having to come back and face the music, right? right? Yes. And have 642 unread messages. I think some of this also goes to, and I see this a lot in my one-to-one coaching, it goes to our sense of identity, right? Like we've all, we all worked really hard to do well in school. We've all put in the hours professionally. We're all doing what it takes to show up as great moms and, and be there for our kids, like in all senses of that term. So the idea of just stepping back and saying, no, thanks. I'm just going to be doing whatever on a beach for a certain amount of time. It's not that we don't want to do that. It's that we feel like unprofessional or we're dropping our responsibilities. There's something that's deeply disconcerting about that. And it's, you have to sort of manage yourself and and figure out how to get past that so you can get what you need. Because if you don't have that time to recharge, it, it just grinds you down. Good point. So how do you recharge? I mean, you're doing so much stuff. Like, how do you do that? Yeah. So good question. And if you ask my kids, they would probably say, I don't don't do it well. Right. I grapple with all these issues as much as anybody else. One technique that has really worked for me though is, and I started this maybe, I don't know, six or seven years ago is that I told myself that I was going to keep a Saturday Sabbath. And I'm using that word in a non-religious sense, just that Saturday was going to be my permissioned day off. I will receive emails But unless they're really urgent, I won't respond to them. I won't make plans unless they're plans that I really, really want to do. Like I won't just sort of, you know, do something out of a sense of obligation. I try and find activities that are restorative to me and pleasurable and let me hang out with my kids. So Saturday is sort of like this great like reset button for me. And even if my week is crazy and I'm, you know, emailing at 1130 at night or whatever, I I have that thing that brings me back to center. And it's just enough to do that without, it's rewarding without taking up too, too much time. So that's, that's my one day a week thing that, that really works. The whole day, like start to finish morning and night, a whole, whole day. I wake up and it's, you know, it's my day. I mean, I'm a mom of two young kids. So oftentimes I'm taking people to birthday parties or, you know, taking pre-pandemic times, you know, doing things that I have to around the house or whatever. It's not a completely responsibility free day. No, no, I know. But it it gives me back that sense of control, right? I'm doing this because it's good for me and because I want to, as opposed to feeling like I'm sort of constantly spinning the plates, which I feel, you know, most moms are. Yes, very true. So what is coming next for you? You have this giant book out here. You have your thriving business. Like, where do you see it all going? Is there anything you want to achieve you haven't gotten to yet? Yeah. So listen, in the in the near term and intermediate term, given the pandemic still going, I think this fall in a way is going to be more stressful for a lot of working parents than even things have been up to this point, right? Because we're all sort of... <laughs> We're a bit depleted and we're facing some, you know, back to work, back to school, et cetera. So then, you know, the the kind of immediate term for me is doing what I can to be of service to individual clients and to organizations. And as much as the pandemic has been awful, right, I mean, just a, a dreadful time, it's been really exciting to see how many working parents networks and affinity groups are sprouting up in every organization and how different corporations and institutions are doing what they can to support working parents. So I've sort of told myself, except for my Saturdays, the next six months or, you know, intermediate term is not going to be about balance for me. It's going to be about trying to jump into that fray and help where I can. So that's, it's exciting. It's a little tiring, but it's exciting and good work. I know. I'm, I'm bracing myself <laughs> for the onslaught, the fall onslaught. The onslaught. Oh. School is starting. Yeah. <sighs> but it'll be fine. It'll be great. <laughs> it will be. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors now that you're also a published author in addition to everything else? Yeah. 
I think the thing that was difficult for me before kind of getting into the writing thing was that I always thought maybe I had imposter syndrome or something, but I always thought that people who wrote books or who had really popular blogs or whatever had some sort of special magic or special experience to them. Like they had to have worked for the New York Times or they had to have, you know, been A students in English or something. And that's true for a lot of people. But really the gating item to producing a good piece of writing is sitting down and really working on it and saying to yourself, I have, let me think about how I would say this to somebody. If I were just talking to them, how do I make that happen on the page? How do I make it valuable and urgent and readable? And if you can do that, then you're in business. And then the the other stuff is, you know, it's kind of putting in the hours and then, you know, there's the whole business side of getting a book published. But I think it's having that sense of self and of confidence that I've got something to say and I'm going to work at getting it out there. Well, you, I have to say, you speak so eloquently that for you to make it sound good on the page will probably be quite, would be easy. Whereas, you know, like (laughs) every sentence you speak in like beautiful paragraphs. Well, we we should have brought my editor (laughs) for, for this book in on the... Because I got to the point in the editing process, Kevin Evers, my incredible editor at HBR, who was absolutely fantastic and the father of two young children, he would, I would get on the phone with him and I could tell by how, how he sighed, how good or bad my writing was. He would go, oh. <laughs> and I would say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll rewrite that chapter. I know it's not good. And let's just say that there was a lot of sighing. He's a really patient guy, but it's just, it's rewriting. It's just, you know, just refining and refining and refining like anything else. Lots of practice. It's very true. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I could have dealt with the size. <laughs> I feel like when you put your words out there, it's like you're, you know, a whole layer of skin is gone, right? You're like so sensitive about it, but maybe not for you. I know. I know. But the fun part about it for me was that because it's, it's coaching that even if Kevin was sighing and my chapter was terrible and whatever. It was all in the spirit and all kind of moving the ball down the field of helping other people feel like, yes, I can do this. I can work. I can parent. I can be myself. There's a solution for this. There's techniques. I have options. And and I felt like that was such a powerful end goal that like I would, you know, I would risk the sighing and rip up, you know, 40 drafts and redo it because that was the outcome I wanted to get to. That's amazing. I love that. It's when you have a mission you're working towards and especially something that's so, you know, altruistic, it's really amazing and has personal benefits as a parent. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I wanted the advice myself. Yeah, exactly. so. so there you go. <laughs> <Let them go>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so now the next person won't be, you know, in the middle of Barnes Noble trying to figure out where to go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Daisy, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. It's so nice to reconnect and yeah, congratulations on your accomplishment. It's really awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 